when I get to heaven, I will be able to sing like that. But until then, I will make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Praise the Lord. When I arrived here at this beautiful church, I was asked, how was your day? And I responded, anytime I get on a plane and it lands, it's a good day. <laughs> Praise the Lord. People sometimes ask me, Barry, how do you feel about flying? And I always quote Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, Lo, I am with you always, <laughs> even until the end of the age. But thank God for flying. Imagine how limited we would be if we, if we didn't fly. I was on the floor of the Senate this morning praying for our lawmakers, and here I am with you in St. Louis on God's holy Sabbath day. Hallelujah. I want to talk about surviving as a wolf or surviving as a lamb in a wolf's world. Surviving as a lamb in a wolf's world. I was in Oxford, Mississippi in 2008. I was preaching at the First Presbyterian Church there. And I was excited, I must confess, to be away from the Beltway. I had the experience that I was covered by a cloak of anonymity. No one knew me in Oxford, Mississippi. I had never been to Oxford, Mississippi before. It was a feeling of freedom. I left my hotel and I went to Ruby Tuesdays. Chaplain Black at Ruby Tuesdays. Wonderful. Nobody knows me. I'm away from D.C. I'm away from the Beltway. A waitress came to my table and said, may I help you, Chaplain Black? <laughs> I said, ma'am, I have not been to Oxford, Mississippi. How do you know who I am? And she says, oh, she says, I'm an insomniac. I like C-SPAN too. I see you every time you open the Senate with prayer. <laughs> and I realize as you should realize that there are eyes watching you. And the only gospel that some people will read is the gospel according to you. And as people watch us, we must recognize that everyone who smiles at us is not our friend. In fact, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 says, All those who live godly will suffer persecution. It's guaranteed. If you're living right, someone should lie about you sometimes. If you're living right, you should be the topic of gossip sometimes. Yeah, I bet you he wears those bow ties because of some pagan religion. You, somebody's going to say something about you sometime. Eh? Oh, you've heard that, have you? Okay. Eh? If you're living right, the Bible says you will suffer persecution. Our Savior, Jesus Christ, in Luke 10, sent 70 of his disciples out two by two. They were ASI people. That's right. In the business place, going out. And he said to them, the harvest is white. You don't have to worry about souls, my brothers and sisters. They're out there. They're ready. The harvest is white, ripe, ready. But the laborers, 
we don't have enough laborers. So what do we do, Lord? We don't have enough laborers. What do we do? Pray, he said. Pray ye that the Lord of the harvest. Oh, I've lived long enough to believe more things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. I don't know what I would do without prayer. If I wanted to see the President of the United States, it would probably take me six months to get on his schedule. If I wanted to see the majority leader of the United States Senate, it would probably take me a couple of hours to get on his schedule. But if I want to talk to the one who created the President of the United States, if I want to talk to the one who created the majority leader of the United States Senate, any hour, any minute, any second of the day, I've got Jesus on speed dial. I don't know about you. I can get him any time I want to. And this boy from the hood, that's right, I'm from the hood, eh? This boy from the hood can go boldly before the throne of grace to receive whatever I need. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Mm, somebody better come get me. I feel like preaching tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. Mm, 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 mm. So the labor is a few. But we have a mighty God who can raise up laborers. We have a mighty God who can able, uh, enable us to reap where we haven't even sown. Oh, bless his name. And he says, pray. Why? Because there are some blessings, ASI, you will never get unless you ask for them. James chapter 4 verse 2 says, you have not because I don't want to get to heaven and discover that God had all of those blessings in store for me, but I never asked for them. See? See, I asked too late to save my hair. You see, you got to ask on time, see? <laughs> You can't, you, you can't delay. You got, you got to have the right time and when you ask. See, it was half gone by the time I said, save it, save it. Too late. The Lord said, I can't even help you now. <laughs> Praise God. But then our Savior said, don't you love the name of Jesus? <laughs> don't you know that demons tremble? at the sound of that name. It is the most polarizing name on the planet. I've been in mosque in Bahrain and Saudi Arabia talking to imams. I can stand in that mosque and say Mohammed and nobody will even look. I can stand there and say Buddha and nobody will even turn around. I can stand there in that mosque and say Confucius and nobody can turn, would even turn around. But all I have to do is whisper, Jesus. Woo! Hallelujah. There is power. Oh, somebody better come get me. There is power. Power in the name of Jesus. I always like to say that name a few times when I get started because there may be some demons sitting here and I want them to know. I got backup going for me. Power in that mighty name. Our Savior said, I'm sending you forth like lambs in the midst of wolves. I am sending you into predatory precincts. ASI, you are not in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. 
It is not a beautiful day in the neighborhood. A beautiful day for a... No, 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 no. You wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. And so don't be naive like Joseph. You know, Joseph was pretty boy. Number one, his mama was Rachel. And Rachel was so beautiful that Jacob started crying when he met her. That's a pretty woman. <laughs> Anytime you start crying at the introduction, that's a beautiful woman. I'm so happy to meet you. I'm so yeah. One of the most amazing Bible verses, Genesis chapter 29, verse 20. And Jacob worked seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days. Pretty woman. Because of the love he had for her. Any woman who can make seven years seem like less than a week. When I get to heaven, after I see Jesus, that's first. Next person I want to see is Rachel. <laughs> I can see I got millennia to see Shadrach, Meshach. I want to see Rachel, okay? Any woman who can make seven years seem like a few days, I got to see Rachel. And after I meet her, I want to see Sarah. Because anytime you're in your 80s and your husband has to say, you look so good, girl. You better say you're my sister. Now, I, next, I, I got to see Sarah. See, I got, I got them all on a list that I'm going to see them. Right? <laughs> oh, pretty boy Joseph, looking like his mama. In fact, the Holy Spirit, you know, the Holy Spirit is not given to the hyperbolic. The Holy Spirit says, and Joseph was handsome and well-built. Now, quite frankly, that's more information than I need, okay? <laughs> but the, the Holy Spirit was so impressed with this boy that he, the Holy Spirit says he was handsome and well-built. When Potiphar brought him home, Mrs. Potiphar said, is it hot in here or is it just me? <laughs> eh? uh, that's the kind of boy he was, eh? And yet, Joseph... Joseph did not realize that he was in predatory precincts. And, you know, Jacob should have known better. Because, see, his brother's mama was Leah. Y'all remember Leah, don't you? The Bible politely said she was tender-eyed. And you can search the, search the commentaries. It's bad news in any commentary. It's bad news. I, they got all kinds, an ocular secretion, cross eye. You, well, it's got that, so, yeah, it was bad news, okay? <laughs> so here is Joseph looking like his mama, Holy Spirit talking about he's handsome and well-built. And here are Leah's boys. And Joseph got a coat of many colors. What you going to do? You're already good looking. Then you're going to dress him up? Oh, and so here he is. Father, go find your brothers. And Joseph, it's a beautiful day in the name of the beautiful day. Where are my brothers? I'm looking for my brothers. Love sees from afar. But so does hate. The story of the prodigal son, Luke chapter 15, the Bible says, and when he was afar off, his father saw him. In Genesis 37, the word of God says, his brothers saw Joseph coming, his coat of many colors, brushing the dew from the lips of the tulips. And they said to themselves, behold, the dreamer comes. Come, now, these are, this is blood talking. Come now, let us kill him and cast him into a pit. And we will say a wild beast hath destroyed him. And we will see 
what will become of his dreams. ASI, you're not in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. Behold, you are being sent as a lamb in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. My hero was mentioned in my introduction. My hero is Daniel. What a man. Comes to Babylon <laughs> in his teens has a seven-decade record of sustained superior performance. Survived in a wolf's world. They tried to take him out repeatedly. And we meet him. Oh, I love this guy. He... He survived the implosion of an empire. This is, this is an amazing guy. You see, the Holy Spirit shows us our heroes and heroines, warts and all. Yeah. If I were writing the Bible, I would have left out the Bathsheba chapter in David's life. Holy Spirit doesn't do that. It shows us. But with Daniel, there is not even a speed bump. Sustain superior performance. That's a biography as a leader, as an individual in the workplace you need to study if you're going to live a worthy life and if you're going to survive as a lamb in a wolf's world. Belshazzar has a feast. They've got all of the different drinks there, you know, the Jack Daniels, the Smirnoff, you know whatever they had, the Babylonian equivalent of that. Daniel is not at the party. A sleeveless hand appears writing on the walls. There is something in the human spirit that tells it that judgment follows the evil deed as the shadow follows the substance. And this brother gets sober. His knees bounce together. Daniel has been so marginalized in his ministry that the king doesn't even know who he is. But you see, when you have the anointing of God in your life, you have an equanimity of temperament throughout the seasons of your life. When they applaud you, you're fine because you're thinking about what does God think, not what people think. When they vilify you, you're fine. Like Paul in Philippians 4, you know how to abound and you know how to abase. But someone is always watching you. The queen mother says to Daniel, to, to Belshazzar, she says, there's a man in your kingdom in whom dwells the spirit of the Most High God. Isn't that awesome? Somebody knows when you are connected to God. Someone in the workplace, when they need to hear from the transcendent, they know whom they should call. And a man in your kingdom in whom dwells... And, and Daniel is not impressed by the pomp and pageantry of the palace. He walks into the banquet hall of reverie. Belshazzar says to him, look, I, I got gifts for you. Daniel said, keep your gifts. You're not going to be king long enough for them to even matter for me. In my neighborhood, we call that jumping bad with the king. Somebody will explain to you what jumping bad is. That is right. I am bilingual. But anyhow. <laughs> Daniel gives the king a history lesson. He talks about Nebuchadnezzar. He no doubt talked about Nabonidus. And then he said, and thou, Belshazzar, though you knew these things, you had the unmitigated gall to take the sacred vessels of God, no reverential awe, and pour liquor 
Now, you want me to read the writing? I'm going to read the writing for you. You let him know that God has scales. And you're being weighed. You've been found wanting. This night, your kingdom will be given to the Medes and the Persians. Turn out the lights. The party's over. This empire implodes. The Medo-Persian Empire emerges, and Daniel is at the top of his game. Now, you know you're special when an empire goes down, a new one emerges, and you're the big guy in the new kingdom. And you know there are going to be some wolves out there who are not going to appreciate that. You're a foreigner. You worship differently. You eat differently. That funny food he, he's eating. Yeah. Well, I, don't, I don't know why he doesn't want any of our Persian fried chicken. What's wrong with him? <laughs> right. And the Bible says they decided to put some detectives on him. Hallelujah. They said everybody's got some skeletons in the closet. Some folk have bodies in the closet. I haven't even had a chance to oxidize yet. Okay. <laughs> Daniel chapter 6. Then these men, well, well, so the governor, verse 4. So the governors and satraps sought, sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they couldn't find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Now, verse 5 is one of the greatest tributes ever made by enemies about somebody. Then these men said, we shall fi not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Somebody, I feel like shouting on that thing. Hallelujah. I mean, they got folk sneaking around and watching him. Tapped his phone. That's what it says in the Hebrew. And, 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 and oh, no, that's right. No, that's right. Alexander Graham Bell. I, I missed that one. Anyway, so, so, couldn't find anything. Nothing. Not a zilch. Because he lived with predictable holiness. And if you're going to survive as a lamb in a wolf's world, you must live with predictable holiness. Your enemies ought to be able to set their watches by your sanctified life. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. So how did Daniel do it? I want to make a few suggestions and then I'll let you go. Suggestion number one, make a commitment to not defile yourself. All kinds of temptations. Siren calls. Romans 12, 21 says, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Daniel chapter 1 verse 8 says, but Daniel purposed in his heart. He made up his mind in advance that he would not defile himself. Make a commitment to purity. Romans 14, 16 says, let not your good be evil spoken of. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says, avoid the very appearance of evil. I was a young chaplain in the Navy in my 20s, and I had to uh, go to some training in Memphis, Tennessee, and the Navy was only going to pay for my airfare, but they were not going to pay for my hotel uh, bill. And when I got there, a friend of mine, a attractive ensign, nurse, said, Barry, I live here. Uh, I've got 
three guest bedrooms in my house, single sister, combination Angela Bassett, Halle Berry, Beyonce, <laughs> rolled up into one. Help me, Holy Ghost. She said, you, and I'm sure her motives were pristine, she said, why don't you just stay in one of the guest rooms and save some money? I said, the devil is a liar. <laughs> <laughs> I said to her, even if we spent all night in prayer, and that is probably what would have been required at all night prayer meeting, okay? If someone saw me leaving your home, you know, neighbors out to pick up the newspaper, whatever, and I'm like, what? As Lucy's husband used to say, I'd have a lot of splaining to do. <laughs> Let not your good be evil spoken of. Make a commitment not to defile yourself. The Our Father does not teach us to pray, lead us not into sin. Too late then. <laughs> Get it in the temptation phase. The philosopher Barney Fife said, nip it in the bud. That's right, I am a philosophy major. Okay? Got to nip it. Number two, if you're going to survive as a lamb in a wolf's world, living with predictable holiness, hear me, hear me. Trust God for favor. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you what I know, ASI. See, I don't care how smart you are. I don't care what you have going for yourself. I don't care how good you are at networking. If God doesn't smile on your efforts, you are singing into the wind. The fifth Psalm, verse 12 says, The righteous are surrounded with the shield of of God's favor. The Bible says of Daniel, Daniel 1 verse 9, God gave Daniel tender love and favor with the prince of the eunuchs. Nebuchadnezzar's chief administrator said, I don't know why I like this guy. This, 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 I, just, I just like him. It is not what you know, it is whom you know. And whom you know who thinks of you in a favorable way. Think of the amazing thing with Esther. Now, she's got a despot that she's dealing with. He kicks Vashti out of her position as royal spouse because she won't do a striptease for his inebriated friends. And now they're going to have a beauty contest. And this is a church girl going to a beauty contest. And God gave her favor with the women who knew the king. They taught her some tips. And then all of them out there, hallelujah. And he only had eyes for Esther. And God, you don't, make no mistake about it, beauty is a gift. Right? 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 7 says, human beings look on the outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. People see the exterior, and God can use that. And he used it to save his people. Remember, Esther, who knows whether you come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Esther chapter 4, you go in before the king, and this is a despot. Remember, this is, a, this is an autocrat. And if he does not extend that scepter, dead woman walking. Okay? And the amazing thing is, girlfriend goes on a fast. Now, you know if you're trying to look good, you're not going to, you're not going to, I've been fasting. You don't want to have a fasting face on you. She goes on a fast because she knows from whence comes the power. And when she walked in there with her fine self, the king could barely find the scepter. He, he couldn't take his eyes off. Where's that scepter? I got that. Oh, there it is. Hey, come on in here. Trust 
God for favor. As you try to bring Christ into the marketplace, God will raise up people for you. The Holy Spirit will go before you and convict people. People will come to you declaring, what must I do to be saved? It is not by might. It is not by power. It is by the Spirit of God. Trust him for favor. And finally, expect God to equip you for the doors he's going to open. Amazing thing here. Look at what God does. I, I marvel at what my God does. Daniel chapter 1 says, not just Daniel, but his, but his posse, his, 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 his friends. Verse 17, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. God equips his children for the doors he plans to open. I was eight years old and we were on welfare. My mama was a domestic and she brought home a record. I'll explain to the young people what a record is later on. But the, come to D.C., I'll show you one in a museum. It's a <laughs> and so it wasn't a music record. It was the only record that we had in the house. So I started playing it with a narration record. A man with a strange voice. I knew he wasn't from the neighborhood. The morning sun had been up for some hours over the city of David. <laughs> Who is this guy? Pilgrims and visitors were pouring in through the gates, mingling with merchants from villages round about. Shepherds were coming down from the hills, and the narrow streets were crowded. There were the aged, stooped with years, muttering to themselves as they pushed through the throng. There were children playing in the streets, calling to each other in shrill voices. There were those carrying burdens, baskets of vegetables, cask of wine, water bags. Uh, tradesmen with their tools. Here a donkey stood sleepily beneath his burden in the sunlight. And there under the narrow canopy a merchant shouted his wares from a pavement stall. It was the voice of Peter Marshall the 56th chaplain of the United States Senate. And I was eight years old, and a rat and roach infested public housing project playing that sermon repeatedly until I had memorized it. God said, this boy's going to need a memory. I, I, I got to program him. I got to equip him with the ability to remember where the wolves are. There had never been a Seventh-day Adventist chaplain of the United States Senate. There had never been a career military officer as chaplain of the United States Senate. There had never been someone with my paint job as chaplain of the United States Senate. But I've stopped by to tell somebody when God gives you favor. Oh, I know I'm right. When God has something for you, no devil in Gehenna can keep you from getting what God has in store for you. Exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you can ask or imagine according to his power working in and through you. God began a sequence of events that enabled me to become a successor to the iconic man called Peter because God is no respecter of persons.
And so I challenge you, live with predictable holiness. I challenge you to remember that it is not Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. I challenge you, my sisters and brothers, to make a commitment. I am not going to defile myself no matter what. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? I will begin to see sin as God sees it. Make a commitment to trust him for favor. You don't need to be calling in IOUs and trying to get somebody to help you. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And no weapon formed against you will be able to prosper. And know that whatever you need to get the job done, whether it is the hand-eye coordination of a David to take out a Goliath, or whether it is the analytical skills of the tent maker from Tarsus to write most of the New Testament, God will equip you. You know, the Bible talks about the spiritual gifts that he gives. You, know, you are a part of a body. Some of you are ears. Some of you are feet. You like to travel. Right? Some of you are hands. Do you know the Bible also says it is a gift if you can encourage people? You know, the Bible speaks of the gift of encouragement. And, and 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 21, uh, 31 says, covet earnestly the best gift. There's the gift of encouragement. Incorporate that into your repertoire as you are a lamb in a wolf's world. Do you know that the Bible says there is the gift of being a helper? I conduct a Bible study, four Bible studies each week on Capitol Hill, several hundred people. And when the, we're setting up the room for the Bible study, the people are coming in, and sometimes I, along with my staff, we're putting Bible studies in the chairs. There are people who will come in, <laughs> sit in the chair, and pick up the Bible study and start reading it. There are others who will come in, take the Bible study out of our hand, and start putting them in the chairs along with us. They have the gift of helping. The Bible speaks of the gift of showing mercy. That's a gift that you can covet. That's a gift that you can incorporate into. He equips you with that ability to show mercy. And there is the gift of charitable giving. And I'm going to say something that's going to shock some of you. You can't take it with you. I know that shocks some. What? Oh, no. That's, that, it can't be. But I got some good news. You can send it ahead. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. And the book of Proverbs says that those who give to the poor are doing what? Bingo. Lending to the Lord. Hey, valedictorian of the class out there. Okay. Lending to. How would you want the sovereign God of the universe to say, I owe you? I'm good for it. I know I owe you. Uh, I, I know, and, and you did some stuff the other day. I owe you for that too. Hallelujah. Says when you reach out, when you help somebody, hear me, I would not be where I am today were it not for the generosity of people who had the gift of showing mercy and the gift of charitable giving. My mother had had three at Pine Forge Academy and two at Oakwood University at the same time. But there were folk who, I used to wonder why when they would shake my mama's hand, they would do, 
both hands. Pearlene, God bless you. God bless you. And I wonder why mom would get a smile on her face. <laughs> you can make a difference, ASI. As I close, I, I invite Paul and Silas to talk to you. Come here, Paul and Silas. Talk to ASI. And I hear Paul say, you know, Barry, we were just doing business in the workplace. But we learned that it was a predatory precinct. I was preaching that night, and a woman started screaming, these men are servants of the Most High God. She kept doing it repeatedly. She was telling the truth, but it was disruptive, and things should be done decently and in order. I felt the anointing of God on me, and I exorcised that demon. The next thing... I knew ASI was before a magistrate, trumped up trial. They beat Silas and me until blood coagulated in our wounds. And then they threw us in a subterranean cell. No sanitation facilities, hands tethered, feet tethered. But ASI, you see, we learn. We learned how to celebrate even in the midst of anguish. Around midnight, I turned to Silas and said, I don't know about you, but I feel like praising him up in here. I know it's not right what happened. I know we've got taken off out of our work, but I feel like thanking God. For he said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, in everything Give thanks, for this is the will of God concerning you in Christ Jesus. Let's have prayer meeting up in here. We started singing ASI, and you know, the our hymn book, we, we sang from the Psalms. I, I said, Silas, where you want to start with? He said, hymn number two, why do the heathens rage? And the people imagine a vain thing against the Lord and against his anointed. I said, well, I'm kind of partial to him. 121, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not suffer my foot to be moved. Behold, he that keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleep. We got so happy, we decided to sing hymn 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom then shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom then shall I be afraid? But you know, every prayer meeting ASI needs an opening song. I said, we don't have this song service, Silas. I'll let you pick the opening song. And Silas said, I like him 100. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All ye land, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. So let the winds blow. Let the storms rise. I'm going to hang in there. I may be a lamb, but I've got a shepherd who will never leave me. I've got a shepherd who will never forsake me. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I wish I had some church folk here. I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, with me in the storm, with me in the rain. And one of these old days, 1 Thessalonians 4 says, the Lord himself, himself, who are you talking about? The one who turned water into wine, himself 
the one who fed 5,000 with five dried biscuits and two sardines. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise fast. Then we who are alive oh, 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 will be caught up. I want to be caught up. I want to be caught up to meet him in the air, to live with Jesus throughout the ceaseless cycles of eternity. I send you forth as a lamb in the midst of wolves. So ASI, live with predictability.